Hello, everyone. Welcome to the CMES speaker series. Uh, I'm Lizzie Burke. I help organize the series. And today I am so very pleased to be welcoming Dr. Leah Buchater, who's a lecturer in development studies at the American University of Beirut. And she was formerly a postdoctoral fellow affiliated with the Sociology, Anthropology, and Media Studies Department, also at AUB. She earned her PhD in Development Studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies of the University of London in 2017. She's also a development practitioner, in which capacity she's authored various reports pertaining to labor issues in Lebanon. Her research interests include state labor relations and social protection, with a focus on migrant workers on the GCC countries. So please welcome Dr. Buchater. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Would you like me to start? Go ahead and start, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Burke, for inviting me. I'm clearly very excited for our discussion today. Um, I would like first to express my gratitude to the Yale Council on Middle East Studies for hosting us to talk about the book, The Labor Movement in Lebanon, Power on Hold. I would also like to thank uh, Ms. Marwa Kabour for her uh, gracious support in the organization of the talk today. Thank you everyone who is here. And I would like to start by answering this. Uh, what made me write this book? Ever since I started conducting research on Lebanon, my overarching question was always about the reasons behind the robustness of the political system and the durable stifling inequalities in our society and about the factors that would trigger and achieve change. Lebanon is constantly at war. The state is captured by an ultra liberal business elite that is closely wedded to the political forces implying stark inequalities and a starved social protection system. In 2005, large protests swept the country, demanding the withdrawal of Syrian troops, which happened, but this was also followed by stagnation in the political and economic system. So the system is, is robust, change seemed impossible. Why is the system durable and how can we change it? So in my research, I first looked into the electoral system and elections as a way for change. Then I looked at business associations and their intertwinement with the ruling elite as a route to capture the state and maintain the status quo. In 2011, I decided to look into social and labor movements also as a main route to change. As we know, at the time, the Arab uprisings brought to the fore basic questions about contentious politics in the Arab world questions about the complex role of labor and social movements and the basic dynamics of change were, vivi were vivified. Uh, trade union politics have seen then an unexpected resurgence in the wider Arab world. In Lebanon, I had read about the strikes and protests of the labor movement in the 60s and the 70s. The um, uh, labor was portrayed as a very powerful period where divisions were more across classes rather than sect. This movement seemed to have been halted by war. However, uh, literature on the topic was scant. Studies on the civil war and sectarianism, as you know, make up most of the research on Lebanon, which have the effect of impinging sectarian logic onto scholarship and largely overlooking other topics and issues that could explain Lebanon. Uh, we can say that labor is invisible in, in, in the story, the history of Lebanon. I decided to investigate and interrogate labor, its structure, trajectories, victories, defeat, until its total silence and all attempts to change after the 1990s. So we can say that the book aims in a way also to break through the invisibility of labor in understanding Lebanon. So to look into, to try to understand Lebanon from the labor perspective. Uh, as I put the final touches to the book, an uprising took place in 2019. I looked for the workers, Based on my research, I could assume that I would not find them. 
Why was labor absent from the uprising? What does this reveal about the economic and political system in Lebanon? What impact does the absence have on the uprising, the absence of labor? How does the uprising affect labor itself? So the relevance of the book had suddenly increased. In other, in other words, what is the uprising or the revolution from the point of view of labor? Is it even possible without labor? Drawing upon the fact that workers' struggles in the past define the current and future struggles, the workers and their trade unions or labor is the, prince, is the principal subject of this book. Now, what topics, issues, and literature does the book address? The book aims to contribute to the understanding of labor politics in Lebanon and the wider Arab world. Um, this research hinges on the centrality of labor in the political and economic struggle for change, as opposed to a postmodernist approach that underlines the decline and significance of labor. It's also more looking into the, um, the essential essence of what human rights is, the economic and social rights. More precisely, this book examines the assault of neoliberal policies on labor when state, when this when the role of the state becomes, you know, to repress labor and uh, create the best terrain possible for capital. Um, so it so this book examines the assault of neoliberal policies on labor um, on the trajectory of the labor movement. Um, the book relies in terms of methodology on process tracing based on qualitative content analysis of previously unavailable archives of the General Confederation of Workers in Lebanon, which is the umbrella uh, institution uh, under which you find all the federations and the unions. Um, so I looked into the archives since the 1990s, as well as the articles and op-eds in the major media from 1990 to 2017. The study also encompasses more than um, but a, a lot of interviews and uh, with pivotal actors in trade union politics, uh, including former ministers of labor, trade unionists, and staff of the General Confederation of Workers. The originality of this book relies in its analysis that aimed to trace the process of state cooptation. So today we know the labor movement is silent, but what is the process that led to the state cooptation? Uh, why and how labor was made irrelevant today. Um, the book, we could say, enriches the analysis of authors such as Joel Beinin, Zachary Lockman, Eva Belin, and John Charlecraft, linking their analysis to my own research findings on the workers' movement in Lebanon. In terms of approach, I adopted an institutionalist approach, an approach that explains the behavior of labor by looking at the institutional framework in which trade unions are created, in which trade unions operate, as well as probing their political affiliations or alliances. So it is this research is attentive to the impact of legal and institutional framework on labor relations, the history of labor legislation. How did we, you know, the history of, you know, at least the, the labor code, let's say, the social security code the relation between state and labor and between trade unions and political parties. Um, a third question that I could also answer is, what are the concerns of this book? First, it's to reflect on the impact of colonial capitalism and nationalist struggles on the formation of the labor movement. And here the book looks into the impact of French mandates on the formation uh, of the labor movement. Um, the French mandate has institu institutionalized in the constitution um, sectarianism. It became in, in, in the texts, uh, the distribution of, of power by sect, and it also had an impact on the formation of the labor movement. Um, I don't know here if I could just read quickly uh, a small, you know, paragraph that a bit uh, illustrates what I'm trying to say, if I find the right page, because I did not plan to do so. Um, I'll just give it one more. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll find it later and I'll, I'll read it for you. Just an instance of the first elections 
uh, of the first printing press union, which is the first union, if we could say one of the first unions, and the French mandate had given a condition that they would allow this election to happen if uh, under the condition that the president of this union would be a Christian Maronite. However, the workers kind of um, refused this condition. Um, most of the workers were Muslim Sunni and decided to vote for, uh, you know, uh, opposition. Uh, uh, they were mostly uh, Christian, but voted for uh, a Sunni president. So this is just to show a small, you know, uh, a taste of this uh, era, which was in the which was in the um, in the thirties. A second uh, concern is to engage the debate on the processes of sectarianization. This book aims to to look at the system from, again, the point of view of labor. How can we describe the system from the point of view of labor, which is, as I said previously, um, has not been done really in, 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 in Lebanon. So instead of sectarianism, I look to explore the process and mechanisms of sectarianization uh, and its impact on the labor movement. And I posit that the institutionalization of sectarianism is used by the ruling elite to protect its economic and financial interests in an open economy. It is essential to, de to debunk the traditional strict perspective of sectarianism and identity politics. Um, a third concern, and I, in my opinion, is also very important and seminal, is to contest the predominant view of the trajectory of the labor movement in Lebanon. Um, the, um, the predominant view is that the weakening of the labor movement in the uh, started in the 1990s, uh, or also started in, in the civil war between 75 and 1990, and it was became more tangible and clear in the 1990s. However, what I tried to case in this book, and I posit, posit that the weakening of the labor movement in the 1990s was more of an intensification of liberal policies that were already in place in the 1943. So if you look at the history and the trajectory, there is no rise and fall of the labor movement, the sectarianization or the institutionalization of sectarianism, uh, the, the liberal policies, um, the, 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 if you want, the, in, the intertwinement between political and business elite have always weakened the structure of the labor movement and in turn its trajectory. Um, a final concern is to reflect on the lessons of this research for Arab and other countries, and specifically for those governed by sectarian power sharing, such as Iraq. Um, so the questions that the book tries to answer, uh, first, what are the obstacles that shaped um, labor power? Um, second, what is the impact of the state cooptation on the unfolding of the political and economic system in the post-war period? So decomposing labor power, brutalist affair model, fragmentation and starvation of social protection system. What is, to, to name a few, and finally, what is the impact of the state cooptation on contentious politics targeting these systems today and present attempts of change? Um, finally, I would say, if you, if you want to, you know, as I, as I started, that the, the struggles in the past define also our struggles today and our organizing in the past as well has an impact on what we can do today. Um, we can say that the economic conditions that had led to labor organizing in history are durable. There is a search today of new form of workers' organizations. And as Dario Azili explains in our collective book um, entitled, If Not Us Who, trade unions are beneficial to employers as they prefer to deal with a representative body and undermine workers' autonomy and guarantee that workers will respect agreement. New forms in Lebanon would include alternative attempts to organize without pre-authorization, not necessarily in the form of a trade union. And in the book, I try to also shed the light on these attempts of organization that are alternative types that are not necessarily a trade union with you know this uh, the structure and the elections and internal regulations so i try to document a very important experience which is the um, organizing of the public sector workers uh, in um, in a gentleman agreement 
uh, under the form of un um, the Union Coordination Committee. And on with this type of organizing, they have mobilized for five years, uh, reaching their demand, which is a new salary scale after, um, uh, you know, uh, a very strong mobilization. And here we can maybe later on talk um, during, you know, the, the discussion about to what extent, and this is the last, you know, the public sector workers are the last avenue of, of, of labor power today. We can discuss, you know, to what extent an IMF plan for Lebanon, because as you know, Lebanon is facing, uh, you know, uh, an extremely serious financial crisis. And an IMF deal is today being discussed. What is the implication of an IMF deal on the public sector? Because as we know, all structural adjustment policies of the IMF would case for, um, you know, the downsizing um of the public sector to what extent this will imp also affect uh, labor power in lebanon something we can discuss later on there's also the association of lebanese professionalists professionals that was inspired by the experience sudanese association of professional of professionals uh, that brought together you know engineers uh, profess university professors um uh, also uh, uh, workers in the um, uh, non-governmental organization sector, in the media and the art under one umbrella, um, to to bridge the gap of the essence of the traditional trade unions in the uprising, uh, an experience to look into um, and to, to 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 try to understand also what's cement trucks blocking the entrances to Beirut in opposition to um, certain uh, policies in, in, in these industries. We have cleaning workers that also mobilized and, and did strikes for several weeks uh, in opposition to, you know, their, their wages that were eaten up by inflation. These are attempts that we must observe. Today, the public sector continues to go on strike. Today, we have the gig economy. Um, you know, the drivers, um, uh, the delivery drivers and taxi drivers of the gig economy are organizing also strikes, which is a new uh, also um, image that we have to observe. Um, you know, in several times when I, when I uh, and this is, I think, the last point that I would like to say, um, as I was doing my research and as I did a lot of presentations, I was sometimes challenged with this uh, idea that why are we looking at the labor movement in Lebanon, a movement that was co-opted uh, at least since the war, uh, a movement that has been absent since the 1990s. What is the point of looking uh, into, into this movement? So in the introduction of the new book, uh, Mahdi Amal and National Liberation, Marxism, uh, Vijay Prashad, in his introduction, cites the Peruvian Marxist Jose Carlos Mayategui, who sought to understand the history and struggles of the indigenous people of the Ant, alongside their domination by the Spanish conquistadors, as you know. And I quote, it is clear that we are concerned less with what is dead than what, 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 than what has survived of the Inca civilization. Peru's past, interest us to the extent it can explain Peru's present. Constructive generations think of the past as an origin, never as a program. In other words, um, quote is closed. In other words, the past is a resource, not a destination. It reminds us of what is possible. Um, and this book interrogates how and why labor power was made irrelevant in a neoliberal uh, racialized uh, system. And it's not a coincidence that it is in the reconstruction uh, period in the 1990s after the war, when extremely harsh neoliberal policies were implemented, that uh, it coincided with the total co-optation and silencing of the movement. Um, the book, documents how 
did this co-optation happen? The strategies that were used back then are being used now on public sector workers. The same strategies of um, uh, intervention in elections, in uh, creating um, what I call hatching of unions um, to you know divide and rule, um, and and you know. It, it is a complicated types of strategies that if you want to know more, you will have to look into the book, but it's these strategies are still used today and it's important to understand how, when and by whom it was used. So I hope that this book would be a resource for students, scholars, policymakers and fighters in their struggle for change and that it will remind us uh, all of what is possible in Lebanon. I hope the book will remind us and future generations to dream of and fight for freedom of association, new types of organizing, which is a sine qua non condition for the creation of a new, fair, and a just society. And here, and I think if, if, if there will be questions, there will be a question, I think, uh, a question that we can discuss on to what extent can we have an uprising, let alone a revolution, without labor power? Historically, um, this this is you know very very rare. Um, I wanted to add one more idea, but I, I I forgot. We can we can discuss this in uh, when we open the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, so folks in the audience, um, there's a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen where you can type questions and then I'll um, read them for Dr. Buchater. So maybe while folks are thinking um, about questions, we also welcome comments. I was actually wondering um, a couple of things. So one is, um, you know, during my research in Lebanon, I encountered folks who had social security of some kind. They were dealing with it, in my case, for health care. Um, but it seemed like that system was also very fragmented, um, perhaps had been co-opted, I'm not sure, or never really, um, mm -hmm. never really allowed to live. <laughs> so I'm wondering what the relation there is between labor power and the social security systems in Lebanon. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, you know, social protection systems in Europe were not created without these, uh, you know, without labor power. Labor power and their um, capacity to shut down uh, production, to shut down the economy was the main leverage to design uh, such social inclusive, comprehensive social protection systems, and here maybe just quickly to 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 explain. I mean, social uh, social protection or social security, which we can use interchangeably, is the the you know a system that protects individual against several risks across life, uh, which can be uh, you know the need for medical benefits, uh, against unemployment, death, survivor, maternity, uh, employment injury, and it can be provided through two ways or tax uh, taxes can be funded by taxes and what we call social assistance, and it can be funded by uh, contribution of employers and employees. Um, in the case of Lebanon, the biggest insurer is the social the social security fund, which is um, you know uh, a contributory system based on contributions. So if you look at the system in Lebanon, um, when you have a co-opted uh, labor movement or co-opted general confederation of workers that sits on the board of the social security system and does not, and in its history, demand for, let's say, a pension, an old age pension, does not demand for the reform of the social security system, does not demand for uh, the reform of the, of the social protection system, you find yourself with a, a weak labor movement and also a starved social protection system. But we can add to this another layer, uh, which is, um, the patron client relationship in Lebanon, the traditional patron client relationship, is built on this clientelism, 
which is an informal type of protection that is offered by the patron, by the political leader. So imagine if you had a strong social protection system that protected citizens equally and in a fair, inclusive way, to what extent the citizen will still need this patron for its protection? And in turn, a social protection system would break the relationship between you know, the traditional relationship and will help people to be able to uh, liberate themselves and you know, try to change uh, the sectarian neoliberal system. So when, so when we look at the system and it's robust, and as I just started my conversation, when you have a robust system and you ask yourself why, two aspects that we can look at to understand and that were not inter, uh, investigated enough in the history of Lebanon, one is labor power that was not present to be able to challenge the system, to stop you know, the economy, to paralyze the system and force change. And at the same time, you don't have social protection of these citizens and they are incapable, not, it's not that they are not aware of the patron client relationship. It's not that they're not aware of, um, you know, to what extent these leaders and these patrons are, to say the least, um, I, I don't want to say the word corrupt, but uh, not good political uh, forces or not useful political forces. They cannot break this relationship because they are not protected, because their protection comes essentially from these patrons. So this is two, these are two perspectives that we need to interrogate and to research more uh, to be able to understand why the system in Lebanon is so robust. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Um, and now we have a couple of questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, so Yusuf asks, he says, thank you very much. Any comments on the relationship between Lebanese labor and Syria? Has Syria had any effect on Lebanese labor? And if so, how? Um, this is a very good question that I also address in the book. Um, Lebanon was, uh, you know, uh, Syria had occupied, occupied Lebanon uh, during the civil war and it was liberate, it was, uh, the withdrawal of the Syrians happened in 2005, if, uh, you know, and during this time, um, the, if we can say that uh, political forces affiliated or politically affiliated to the Syrian regime have always been in charge of the Ministry of Labor, something that I document. So ministers between, you know, if you want, um, the 80s uh, till 2005 were very close to the Syrian uh, regime. This is one aspect of it. It also the Syrian regime also played a role in this in the state cooptation uh, through political forces in Lebanon, and also you have a very um, uh, Syrian workers uh, um, made up a big uh, percentage or proportion of the labor market in Lebanon. So yes. Um, Syria, during its uh, occupation of Lebanon, the Syrian regime did play a role in the cooptation, in the also um, regulation of the labor market. Thank you very much. And now we have a question from Marsha, who says, thank you for your talk and congratulations on the publication of your new book. I was wondering too, can you show us the book? Ah, yes. <laughs> in case we want to purchase it. Okay, there it is, thank you. Um, and then Marsha asks, in Egypt, textile workers and their labor union have been critical to protest movements, including in 2011. What are the major labor unions in Lebanon and which ones have been most effective in strikes and protests in the past decade or so? Um, um, the major, okay, Lebanon is not, uh, does not have a, a big industrial sector. Uh, the biggest sector in Lebanon is services and used to be comprised mostly of, uh, you know, banking services, insurance, uh, uh, restaurants and hotels. Um, the major labor unions in, in Lebanon, if you want to uh, look into the private sector, uh, we have um, teachers in the private sector and we have uh, workers who worked in public private enterprises. Um, taxi drivers are also a big, uh, a big union, uh, basically transport. 
if we want to look at the public sector, the public sector um, is not allowed to have unions, but they are allowed to have cultural leagues. These uh, every uh, so uh, public sector teachers in the secondary have a public league. Public sector teachers in the primary have a public have a cultural league, and these leagues have, since the seventies have acted in an um, ad hoc way as a union. Legally, um, they don't have the right to go on strike, but they do since the 70s. Public sector workers have a very big, uh, you know, have a, have a bargaining power that um, mainly consists of basically the te public sector teachers that are also very uh, linked in their protests and organizing to private sector teachers because they have the proctoring and uh, grading of uh, baccalaureate, which is the highest uh, national exam. And they have used this uh, bargaining power to leverage the entire public sector. And they have been the most active in the past uh, decade. Uh, we can say that in terms of the private sector, uh, ever since uh, 2000, so 20 years ago, they have been mostly silent and did not uh, participate in in major attempts, uh, major strikes or protests, but I would say we can go one step further in 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 um, if you want describing or analyzing the um, the private sector trade unions or the general confederation of workers, which is the spokes. Uh, the body that speaks for uh, labor, um, this body has has been used not has not only been silenced but also used by the political elite in the allotment of rent and their conflict over the rents of the country, uh, allotment of rent that we call al muhasasa. So when you had this political elite and its conflicts over rents, the confederation was used against. Uh, against different parties. So let's say if you want, whenever the prime minister at the time, which was uh, Rafi Hariri, um, decided to go on a, or to take some, uh, or to devise some policies that were not, um, you know, uh, approved by the Speaker of the House, the Speaker of the House would, in a way, use the General Confederation of Workers to pressure the prime minister. So it wasn't only silent, but it was also uh, used in this allotment of rent. If you want to go even further, uh, if, if I'm taking too much time, you can stop me, but, if, but this is an important question. If you want to go also further, we got to a point where the situation became very absurd and we can try to, 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 to explain it. So in 2011, the Minister of Labor in Lebanon proposed a wage hike, the minimum wage hike, um, let's, we will not go into the numbers. The General Confederation of Workers in Lebanon stood against the Minister of Labor, demanding a wage hike lower than what the Minister of Labor was proposing and casing for and promoting and, you know, trying to prove against the, the inflation and the consumer price index. And the question is, how is this possible? We're talking about wage, right? And to understand that, we have to understand exactly this is why it's important to document the state cooptation in the past, uh, or to track in the in the ten years between um, two thousand and two thousand and ten. Um, the one way of co-opting the movement is to create fake unions and to create fake federations. Why is that important? Because the decision make the 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 council, the executive council that makes decision of strike or not, of protest or not, is composed of representatives of federations. Each federation is represented by only two. Regardless of your size as a federation, regardless of how many workers are represented by this federation. If you have 5,000 workers represented by you, by this federation, or 500, you get only two. And these two are not elected, they are um, nominated by the federation, which means creating fake federations will, will 
um, will imply that you can control the decision making in the council. And it's in the past, in the process of 10 years, the decision making of the confederation was controlled in that way. In the hatching of federations and in the manipulation of elections. And this is how we get to a point where the confederation stands against the minister for a wage hike for the workers. So I don't think we can ask about which uh, union was very effective because uh, the situation is really more absurd and more complicated than that. Thank you very much. That is indeed very absurd. Um, and now we have a question from Hala who asks, is labor power historically in any way correlated with economic growth? Um, I can say that in Lebanon, it was not. If we look at, um, you know, the increase in number of unions and federations, the increase happened um, in 19, uh, starting 1997 uh, until 2010. The increase, if we look at the types of sector, at uh, the, the types of unions, on the geography, and we try to link it to the labor market, it is not linked in any case, in any shape or form. And this shows again that this increase does not represent, does not represent uh, you know, um, uh, workers, and that these unions do not have this representativity. And here we'll, we, we, we can also look into the cooptation, the hatching, the manipulation um, to control the, the confederation. But what's more important, what does this tell us? I mean, we're not looking at the cooptation just to say, okay, the labor movement was co-opted in that way. This is a proof that labor power is important and labor power is capable of challenging the system in place. This labor power is capable of protesting, of striking, of demanding social security systems, of, of demanding a more fair economic system, uh, of demanding, you know, of at least shouting how, um, you know, uh, uh, um, Detrimental is the inequality in the system when you have 10% of the society capturing more than 60% of its wealth. And it's because of this threat, and this is why we call, and this is why the title is Power on Hold, is because of the threat that, uh, what we would say, a lot was invested, tons were invested in the capturing of labor power. Otherwise, the strategies that were used between the 90s the end of the 90s to 2010 were not were not devised and this is i think the essence of 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 this research that labor power is capable of challenging the system and it is in it, it is why there is um if you want a consensus between in in political in the political forces in lebanon a consensus to keep this power on hold and here i can give you an example um, so here we're, we're drafting away from the question, but it's it's uh, it's also a way to continue uh, or to, to to shed light on 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 important aspect in the book. Uh, when public sector workers, after five years of mobilizing, have achieved their demands partially, um, the, the the Lebanese neoliberal racialized system um, took two major decisions to break the public sector workers. One of them, it was for the first time that the Ministry of Education took the decision to cancel the exams of the National Baccalaureate and taking away from the teachers their tool that they have used in the 70s. So, and that year, which is I think 2017, everybody in Lebanon passed the exam because the teachers, I mean, they just, because the teachers refused to correct, uh, the ministry said, okay, we don't need your corrections. And this was a very a big, uh, I would say, a monumental decision that uh, broke uh, the public sector. And this was, there was a consensus. 
And also there was a consensus between all political parties to, um, if you want to have uh, agreed upon candidates on the next elections of these leagues, the, 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 there was a consensus and all of them voted against the leaders that led the mobilization for the past five years, all of them. It's, I mean, they all of them agreed on that point. It also again sh uh, shows um, the role of labor power, um, and it's and the implication of the cooptation on on keeping the system as is. Thank you very much. Um, we have some more time if folks want to put more questions in the Q and A. Um, in the meantime, I have another one, which is mm -hmm. you talked a little bit about this in other countries outside the Lebanese context. I'm wondering, like, we're seeing more labor movements happening in the U.S. and around the world. I'm wondering if there's any links between like global solidarity movements in Lebanese labor or not really. Um, if it has an like an, an implication on the Lebanese scene, you mean? Yeah, like do do Lebanese labor movements sort of say like where we stand with our brothers and sisters in Bolivia or whatever? Is it sort of a international scene or not really? Um, you know, we, we have to keep in mind that currently um, Lebanon and workers specifically are facing a very harsh uh, financial crisis. And in these uh, situations, uh, labor organizing and labor solidarity become even more difficult because it's more about, you know, survival and concentration on, on, on the current, uh, on the situation here. I don't know if you know the 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 recent mobilizations of the gig economy um it's more of like this iterative process where they have been inspired by let's say uh the protests in other parts of the world specifically also in very difficult contexts like the uae but um more than that i would i i i wouldn't think so um yeah that makes sense, thank you. Um, and my final question is, oh, here's another one. I'll save mine. Um, so Laura asks, thank you so much for your presentation, which I enjoyed listening to very much. Could you elaborate a bit more on the role of migrant labor in Lebanon's recent history and present? Um, thank you, Laura. Um, um, if you, I don't know if the question is about the role in the labor movement or in the labor market, but I would answer. I would answer both. Uh, I suppose um, one um, one important, if you want, um, entry point uh, to, to to that. Um, initially, um, you know foreign workers, if you want to say foreign or migrant workers in Lebanon, sorry. Um, a lot were, were Syrian refugee, uh, Syrian, uh, Palestinian refugees. Currently we have also Syrian refugees. And at some point when migrant workers uh, started to um, become more important in terms of, uh, you know, weight and size in the Gulf countries, this is when this the migrant workers, um, non-Arab migrant workers start also to, to 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 play an important role in the labor markets in Lebanon. Um, we ha I, I think we have to look at the Lebanese system, and I said it as as I was you know uh, discussing, as a neoliberal racialized system. Um, the, the Lebanese economy uh, or the Lebanese economic system takes advantage of 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 uh, migrant labor. Um, you know, by by you know, migrant workers, specific, the sector where the migrant workers are mostly predominant are sectors that are excluded in the labor law. So the labor law in Lebanon, and this is where where we talk about you know the the racialized system. The labor law in Lebanon excludes agricultural workers and domestic workers, and these are two sectors that are pre predominantly migrant workers. And here we're talking about. Uh, workers who don't have any labor protection and, of course, no uh, social security. Um, in terms of um, labor mobilization, also migrant workers can be part of trade unions, but they cannot participate in the elections. Um, but we can um, 
we noticed the mobilization and alternative types of organizing of migrant workers after the crisis in 2019. And this is because of the dearth of the foreign currency and where the wages of these workers, I mean, this is the most vulnerable, these are, this is the most vulnerable category of workers in Lebanon, whether it's legally, economically, financially, linguistically, socially, because they, they, are, they were the first hit by the crisis and the first to mobilize and to organize, whether they were the cleaning workers in Ramco or domestic workers that were um, um, deserted by their employers. Um, and I think they led a bit uh, the way for other other workers. Um, of course, what's also I mean, probably you you know, uh, Lebanon like Jordan and and the Gulf regions is marred by the sponsorship system, and this sponsorship system also um, renders the the position of uh, migrant workers very very uh, uh, weak and vulnerable. And in turn, um, their role in the labor movement is also very minimal. I can I can develop if you want a bit on the sponsorship system. Um, I mean, the, the sponsorship system is not a legal system. It's not something that you can find in the texts as we can imagine. It's only a set of um, rules and regulations by the general security. Uh, that links the, the, the residency of the worker to their employer. Um, and it, it makes the movement of labor very, very difficult. Um, there's something else I wanted to say about this and I forgot. Thank you very much. Um, and another question, you sort of mentioned this at the end of your talk, but I was curious if you could say more, the question of can we have revolution without labor power? And it seems to me that that's one of the main reasons Lebanon and many other places have kept down labor or kept the power on hold. But I'm wondering if you can speak a little more about that. Yeah. Um, historically, um, labor organizing, even it doesn't yield the full or the total, you know, uh, um, the total, the, to the totality of demands. Uh, it, it's it's. Historically, we can say that this is the, um, the fastest way and the most secure way uh, to get the demands. It's by labor organizing. Again, it's because it's the only uh, power that can uh, halt production and can uh, affect the capital. Um, in Lebanon, if you look at the Arab, at, at the um, at the uprising in 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 uh, that started in October, we did a, uh, me myself and Rima Majed a survey in the first ten uh, days of the uprising uh, about the reasons uh, why people decide to take to take the streets, and um, unlike what we think, it's not about you know the politics and it's not about you know, corruption, it's more about social and economic grievances. And um, and here, when you don't have uh, labor unions to, to, to advance these demands about fair wages, about social security, about the benefits and the guarantees of workers and their families, the, the uprising, um, you know, became as Asif Bayat often writes about the Arab uprising, a revolution, you know, reforms, you know, you would demand reforms, not a revolution. So you don't have um, the power or, you know, this labor power that would um, advance a pro, uh, an economic and social program and would push for it. And you know you would have more slogans about we want uh, we don't want corruptions uh, we don't we want uh, elections which is you know just a set of reforms that do not change the system and essentially the problem of the of the system in Lebanon it's it's inequality and the problem is not the corruption of these uh, the leaders I mean if you keep the system as is and you bring very clean people it doesn't change anything and this is a common um, 
you know, uh, a common thread across the Arab uprisings, whether it's in Egypt or in Tunisia or in Lebanon. So whenever you don't have the focus on this inequality, basically, when it's not about class struggle, that necessitates, you know, the change of the system, we get to, you know, um, at best, to a sort to, to to reforms that are decided and implemented by this leadership that you want to topple, and by a leadership that can at any point in time turn the table upside down, upside down. Um, historically, revolutions without uh, labor organizing materialize. Thank you very much. Um, and we're about out of time, but before I say goodbye, um, I wanted to remind everybody that next week, so Thursday, the same time, 12 p.m., we're going to have a talk by Dr. Natasha Iskandar from NYU. The talk of hers is related to yours. Um, Does skill make us human? Migrant workers in 21st century Qatar and beyond. And that'll be hosted by Yale's Dr. Salma Musa. So thank you so much, Dr. Bukhata. We appreciated your talk very, very much. And thank, thank you, Dr. Burke, for inviting me. Absolutely. And Francesco says, thank you for this amazing presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.